All right, this video is going to give you an introduction to radicals. Uh, you might know them as the, like square roots, cube roots, fourth roots, whatever. All right, so to begin with, uh, let's talk about some specific notation. So this is called radical notation. The n is called um, the index. So n is the index of the radical. Um, a is the radicand, right? So whatever's underneath the radical sign there is called the radicand. And yeah, the the uh, this symbol right there, that's just called the radical sign. Nothing fancy about that. All right, and the whole thing is called a radical. So you've probably seen things, say, like, and you'd read that as the square root of 9. Now notice that the index is missing. We didn't write the index inside the little wedge there. If we don't write a little number inside the wedge there for the index, the index is understood to be a 2 for square root. Otherwise, we'll put like a 3 in there, meaning cube root, or a 5 in there for fifth root, or something like that. Right? So when there's nothing in there, it's understood to be a square root. So this um, is read the square root of 9. And that could be 3. Right? That's equal to 3. But you might be thinking, well, that could also be equal to negative 3, you know, because when you when you square 3, you get 9, but when you square negative 3, you also get 9 back. So there's a bit of a dilemma there. And that's where this idea of principal square root comes into play. Right? The principal square root is going to be the positive one. So the square root of 9 is going to be equal to 3, not negative 3. However, if we said, like, the, the square root of of, excuse me, if we say the negative of the square root of 25, that's going to be equal to negative 5, right? But the square root of 49, well, that's just 7. Okay, the principal square root means we want the positive one there. All right, so back to, say, the square root of 36. So this notation is really asking us to find some number that we can square that will give us 36. And since we've already talked about the principal square root, we know that number is 6. But what about, say, something like the square root of negative 4? So now we're looking for some number that when we square it, we get negative 4. Well, we know that if we take any real number and square a real number, we're going to get a positive number back. So this is called not a real number. All right? We'll deal more with those later. They're, they're actually a, another set of numbers that we'll learn about later. All right, so what about, say, something like... This is read the cube root of 8, right? Because we've got the little 3 in there for the index. It means the cube root of 8. So now we're looking for some number that when we raise to the third power that we cube will give us 8. Well, that number would be 2 because 2 cubed is 8. Everybody see that? So what about the cube root of negative 8? So again, we're looking for some number that when we cube it, we get negative 8. Does everybody get negative 2? Because if you take negative 2 and cube it, you're going to get negative 8 back. So if the index is odd, um, then it doesn't matter if we have a positive number in the radicand or a negative number in the radicand, you'll get a real number back. But if the index is even, uh, then uh, we want the radicand to be a positive number. Otherwise, we have um, something that's called not a real number. All these numbers that we've got in here, let's see, the square root of 36 is 6, cube root of 8 is 2, cube root of negative 8 is negative 2, these are all rational numbers. Something like, say, the square root of 7 is called an irrational number. Um, so we've got rational numbers, we've got irrational numbers. Together, those make up the, the real number system that we're used to playing with. So irrational numbers you, that you know about ahead of time would be like pi. All right, pi is an irrational number. Well, so are the square root of 7, square root of 2, uh, anything where it doesn't just come out to give you a nice little integer. Square, like, square to, like the square root of 36 just goes to 6. Um, those are called irrational numbers. If you use your calculator to say find like the square root of 29, that's going to give you an approximation of about 5.3852. Um, but again, and that goes on forever. We had to cut it off there. That's when we're using the approximation sign there. The square root of 29 would be an irrational number, but we can get an approximate value for it if we need to use it. All right, so some numbers to kind of keep in mind then would be called perfect squares. Perfect squares would be something like, well, we'll start with 1. 1 squared gives you 1. 2 squared gives you 4. 3 squared gives you 9. Everybody see that? 4 squared, 16. 5 squared, 25, 6 squared, 36, so forth and so on. You can kind of make this list, right? Um, and like 11 squared is 121, 12 squared is 144. 
Now, these numbers over here on the right are called perfect squares. 1, 4, 9, 16, 25, 36, so forth and so on. Uh, and you, this list goes on forever, right? It's a good idea to know as many of these first 12 um, as possible. Preferably the first 12, right? All of them would be good to know. That will just speed things up for us later on. Later on. It's like it's, it's good to know that 64 is a perfect square, right? 8 squared gives you 64. Very good idea for you to know those. Another thing to know would be some perfect cubes. And some perfect cubes would be, well, we can make a list there. 1 cubed is 1. 2 cubed is 8, 3 cubed is 27, 4 cubed is 64, 5 cubed is 125. And we could keep going if we want, but if, if you know the first five, uh, then you're, you're in pretty good shape. If we need anything bigger than that, we can always go extend our list. But if you know that 1, 8, 27, 64, 125, if you know those are perfect cubes, that will help speed some things up a little bit later down the road. All right. All right. So let's look at let's get an idea down here. Suppose we've got this. Okay, the square root of three squared. Well, one way to look at that is to say, all right, that's the square root of nine, which goes to three. Okay. So some of you might be saying, well, yeah, you got the square root um, in a square. So you're taking the square root of a square. So that just leaves you the number three behind, right? And technically speaking, that that is you know what happened. But the dilemma comes into play when we have, say, something like the square root of negative 5 squared. This doesn't just go to negative 5, right? The square root does not undo the square, just leaving negative 5, because remember, we're talking the principal square root, right? It needs to be actually equal to a positive 5. One way to do it is to just say, all right, this goes to the square root of 25, because negative 5 squared is 25, and that goes to 5. But the other way to think about it, and what we'll need to do when we get variables involved here in a minute, is to go, all right, well, since we've got the square root of a square of this negative number, that's the same thing as just the absolute value of that number, which gives us 5. So, for example, let's look at, say, something like the square root of x squared. So we don't really know what x is. x can represent any real number. So x could be a negative number, we don't really know. So the square root of x squared is going to be the absolute value of x just because we don't know the number for x, since, it's, since x can be any real number. Suppose x, we knew x was greater than or equal to 0, then the square root of x squared would just be equal to x, because we know that's going to be a positive number, right, because x is greater than 0. Everybody see that? When we don't know, we really need to have the absolute value bars there um, to make sure the principal square root thing still comes into play. Um, we don't have to worry about it when we're talking um, odd index. It's when, it's when it's even. The formal idea here, the nth root of a to the n power. If n is odd, then the nth root of a to the n just equals whatever a is. Okay, the cube root of negative 5 cubed is just going to be negative 5. Right? If n is even, then the nth root of a to the n really is the absolute value of a. And that's because we're letting a be all real numbers here. I right, suppose we had the cube root of 27x cubed. We say, all right, we're looking for something that when we cube it, we're going to get 27x cubed. Well, 27 is the same thing as 3 cubed, right? So, so we'd have just 3x, because the cube root of x cubed is just x there, right? If you take 3x and cube it, raise it to the third power, you'll get 27x to the third back. Notice we don't need any absolute value bars. But if we had, say, the square root of 64x um, squared, then we would need 8 times the absolute value of x because we don't know what x represents. If we knew that x was positive, then it would just be 8x. All right, you kind of follow what I'm getting at there? So uh, one more. Let's say we've got the cube root of negative 8x cubed y to the sixth. All right, so let's say it's going to be a negative 2 because negative 2 cubed is negative 8. The cube root of x cubed would just be x. And the cube root of y to the sixth, what do you think that might be? 
Remember, we're looking for something when we cube it, we get y to the sixth. Well, that'd be y squared. All right, again, we don't need the absolute value bars because we're talking an odd index here um, happening. All right, so that's it for an introduction to radicals with the notation and uh, in the principal square root, how the absolute values work with uh, an even index and whatnot. All right, all right, there'll be a lot more later on, so study well. Please let me know if you have any questions.